And as you're praying for people transitioning, just want to encourage you to pray for Marco and Amanda Rodriguez as well. So they'll be relocating. Uh, So just as you're thinking of all these different families, be praying for them as well. Well, As we begin, I want to remind us about the Exodus story. If you remember the book of Exodus, right? At the end of Genesis, Joseph dies and there's a new king in Egypt. He's no longer friendly to the Israelites. In fact, he appoints taskmasters over them. So they labor under brutal treatment, yet grow in number. And the more they grow, the more he oppresses them. And the more he oppresses them, the more they grow. God's abundant blessing. So God raises up Moses to deliver them. He delivers them through the ten plagues, including the death of the firstborn. So the last plague is the promise promise of death and judgment. And according to chapter 11, verse 1, as a result, Pharaoh will set God's people free, who up to that point were enslaved down in Egypt for 430 years. So they're going to be delivered not only from death and judgment, but they're also delivered from enslavement. How does that happen? Well, Exodus 12, through the Passover lamb. So an unblemished lamb without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, right? They put the blood over the doorposts and that lamb is perfectly sized for each family. Why is that important? Well, because the lamb is to be identified with them so that the lamb can be a substitute for them. So that when the death angel comes, someone is going to die. For the Egyptians, it's the firstborn, but for the people of God, it's this spotless lamb. And so death passes over, and they live. But I want you to be crystal clear this morning, because the book of Exodus is split into two very distinct parts. Exodus 1 to 15 is all about this glorious salvation that takes place through this Passover lamb. Then Exodus 16, all the way to the end of the book, Exodus 40, gives us the purpose for this glorious salvation. And that purpose is declared in Exodus 19, verse 5. Listen to these words. This is the Lord speaking. The Lord says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, And you shall be a kingdom of priests, and you shall be a holy nation. And then what happens in Exodus 20? Well, he gives them the Ten Commandments, right? He gives them the Word of God, which is what? It's instructions on how they are to live as the people of God, how they are to live holy lives, And that gets played out, Exodus 25 to 40, which is all about the priests. How are the priests supposed to be? The priests are supposed to be holy. And then we give instructions about the tabernacle, right? What is the tabernacle? The tabernacle is the portable temple. It's the place where God dwells with his people. So God saves them so that they might be a unique, distinct treasured possession so that they might be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that he might, so that they might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called them out of darkness, out of this judgment, right, through the Passover lamb and into his marvelous light, salvation. So God saves them to be holy. And Peter picks up on all of that language in the book of 1 Peter. So if you would, go ahead and open with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's on page 1014 if you're using one of the Bibles in the chairs in front of you. I encourage you to open your Bible, 1 Peter. I also encourage you to grab my outline. The title of my sermon this morning is Holiness in the Church. Love as the people, love as the family of God, long for the word of God, and live as the people of God. You get the first Peter. I just want to highlight how he's working out of the book of Exodus. And you see it even as he opens up. Look at what he says in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great 
mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What is he doing? He starts by highlighting the wonder of God's glorious salvation. But that salvation has a purpose, just like Exodus, so that we might be holy. Look at where Peter goes. Look at verse 14. It says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So God saves us to be holy, to be his unique, distinct, set-apart, treasured possession. He saves us to be a holy people. But what exactly does that look like, Peter? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. Peter's going to answer it for you, right? Pick it up with me in verse 22. I'll read verse 22 all the way to chapter 2, verse 10. Listen to what Peter says. This is a description of what holiness looks like in the church. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, here it is, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, are you hearing the language of Exodus 19 here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10? It's almost identical language, right? A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So God's saving a people so that they might be holy. And did you hear how often he references the word of God? Verse 23 through the living and abiding word of God. Verse 25, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. Chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn infants long for the pure milk of the word. That's the literal translation. So it's a holiness among God's people that is informed by the word of God, just like Exodus 20 to 24. And we even have the priesthood language and the temple language of Exodus 25 to 40. So God can dwell in our presence where we will be his people and he will be our God. But again, the question, right? He saved us to be holy, but the question is, what does that holiness look like, especially in the church? Well, number one, it looks like loving one another 
as the family of God, which is Peter's main point, chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Look again at what Peter says, verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, here's the command, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding word of God. So Peter gives us two reasons why we should love one another as the family of God. Number one, because you obeyed the truth. And number two, because you are born again. But what's Peter getting after with that language? Well, he's talking about people who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? I mean, that's what it means to obey the truth. It's to hear the good news of the gospel. Repent and believe in it. Right? In fact, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 commands us to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And what's the promise, according to Paul? That you might be saved. That's the clear call of Scripture. But that command requires a response. And the response, according to Peter, is their obedience to the truth. So Peter's talking about conversion. And that becomes abundantly obvious from the second reason he gives in verse 23. He says, since you've been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable seed, that is through the living and abiding word of God. So purifying your souls to an obedience to the truth is synonymous with being born again. But notice the details. Because believers are not just born again with perishable seed, meaning some sort of seed that goes into the ground and dies, but instead we're born again with imperishable seed. Doesn't that remind you of James? Right? James chapter 1, verse 21. James says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness, what? The implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So James's implanted word is Peter's imperishable seed. Which, by the way, if you spend any time reading through the book of 1 Peter, you'll quickly realize imperishable is one of Peter's favorite words. Why is that? Because he's constantly talking about things from an eternal perspective. Right? I mean, just think about it. I, I, I hit it as I read and we were making our way into 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. You can flip back there, right? God causes us to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that is imperishable. It's eternal. Look at chapter 1, verse 18. He says, and we're redeemed, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the imperishable blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? He's constantly talking about things from an eternal perspective. So the human seed of a man is earthly and perishable, and even if it does produce a son or a daughter, which it often does, that child will eventually die. But this imperishable seed, this living word of God, will never, never wither away or die, like the grass of the ground or the flowers of the field. But it remains forever, and it results in a person being born again to a living hope in a living Savior with an eternal, imperishable inheritance. So believers are born into a whole new family, aren't they? They're born into the family of God. And how does that happen? Well, that's B, by the living word of God, which, of course, Peter clarifies in verse 25, right? It's not just the word of God. He tells us that it's the good news of the gospel, which was preached to these believers 2,000 years ago. And that same gospel is still being preached today. And what's the result? Well, the gospel is the power of God for salvation, but the gospel is also the power of God for sanctification. So the gospel radically transforms our lives, transforms us from being people who hate God and hate the people of God to being people who love God and love the people of God. Right? That's the main point of this whole section, that we would love one another. As the family of God. Look at verse 22. He gives us the description. Earnestly and from a pure heart. Now what exactly does that 
look like, practically speaking? Well, first and foremost, I think it starts by us recognizing that we're called and commanded to have a unique love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So yes, we should absolutely do good to all people. We should absolutely do that. But we should have a special, unique, distinct love, not only for God, but for the people of God. Right? I mean, that's why Jesus tells us in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I loved you. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. How? By our love for one another. Right? So that's a special, unique, distinct love. And Peter describes that love as earnest and with a pure heart. So let me just ask, are you earnest in your love for the people of God? Are you sincere? Are you purposeful in your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Right? Others is, love is others-oriented. Are you interested in their lives as much as you're interested in your own life? Or are you consumed with self, your own personal needs? Right? I'm asking, are you earnestly concerned with how others are doing? That's where we get the language in the Bible of weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. Here's a question. Are you as concerned with other people's reputations as you are about your own? I mean, do you work hard speaking well of others or do you gossip and slander? Right? Do you assume the best of others or do you jump to uninformed conclusions and assume the worst? Do you hear how all these questions are related to earnestly loving one another from a pure heart and how that's a picture of our corporate holiness, a people set apart, unique and distinct in their relationship first with God but then with one another. Because it means that we prioritize our relationships in the family of God. And we work really, really hard to preserve them. Which means we're quick to encourage. We're quick to serve. We're quick to sacrifice. We're quick to offer a kind word and a helpful hand. It also means that we're quick to resolve tensions. Issues, conflict. Why? Well, because we know all people will know that we're Christ's disciples by our love for one another. So our love for one another is our greatest apologetic to a lost and dying world. So in the same way that we pursue individual holiness with purpose and passion, we are to pursue love for one another earnestly and with a pure heart. Why? Because that represents our corporate holiness as the people of God so that God might be glorified. So the gospel is the power of God for salvation, marked by our love for one another, but the gospel is also the power of God for our sanctification, marked by our ongoing reconciled relationships. Because we not only, number one, love as the family of God, we also, number two, long for the word of God. Specifically to have its good effect on those relationships. Right? Look at what Peter says. I'll reread chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. He says, So, or therefore, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. That's sanctification. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now again, I want you to notice the importance of the word. 
Because the literal translation of verse 2 says, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it, by the pure milk of the word, by the gospel, you might grow up into salvation. So the gospel is not only the power of God for salvation, it's also the power of God for sanctification. Notice how it's the same gospel being preached. There's no chapter breaks in the original manuscripts, which means chapter 1 rolls right into chapter 2. Verse 25 ends by saying, and this is the good news of the gospel that was preached to you. So, or therefore, put away all malice and deceit, hypocrisy and all envy and all slander. How? Here it is. Long for the pure milk of the word. That by it, the pure milk of the word, i.e. the gospel, verse 25, you may grow up into salvation. So the main point of these three verses is the command to long for the Word of God. Because Peter knows that the Word of God speaks directly to how we treat one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want you to notice how everything he's talking about here in verse 1 is relational. Notice that. It's all relational. And it all threatens our love for one another as believers, right? I mean, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Those are all negative words, aren't they? They are all things that threaten our ability to cultivate love in the body of Christ. But before we look at them specifically, let me first interact on this phrase in verse 1, right? He says to put away. That's not put away in the sense of put away once and done, but it's put away as in an ongoing action. That's why I listed A as cast out all evil attitudes and actions, ongoing fight. And the best illustration I have for this is a garden. I just, just think about a garden. Right? Some of you, this is really super easy because you're really good at gardening, right? I, I'm not one of those people. I don't have a green thumb or whatever other colored thumb you need in order to be a good gardener. I don't have that ability. That's not a gifting that God has given to me. Right, but for all of you that are good gardeners, right, you know how to grow fruits and vegetables and flowers or even grass for that matter. I'm not even capable of doing that. Right? What grows naturally? What grows naturally? Right? Do, do fruits and vegetables and flowers grow naturally? Do you have a major problem at your house of like flowers just coming out of the ground everywhere and blooming and making a beautiful lawn for you? No. What grows naturally? It's weeds. It's dandelions, right? Even I can grow weeds, right? It takes hard work to grow something that is beautiful. Only that which is like weeds grows naturally. Or, yeah, grows naturally. The same is true in our relationships. Right? Our relationships require the ongoing cultivating work of putting away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, which is sin, the ongoing work of putting relational sin to death so that we can grow something that is beautiful. Relationships that are marked by love for one another as the family of God. I mean, do you recognize that most churches do not split or have difficulties because of theological differences. That's not what happens. Most churches split because there's relational tension. Right, one person gets mad at another person and then all of a sudden we start creating sides and like we start recruiting people. Hey, did you know about so-and-so? And we recruit people on our side and those people say, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? And they recruit people to the other side and all of a sudden we're split. Nobody sits in the middle anymore. Everybody sits on one side or the other, right? That's what happens. There's relational tensions that cause division in the church. So you and I need to embrace the fact that this is an ongoing fight against sin. But be clear, it's an ongoing fight against relational sin. In fact, Paul uses the exact same language in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. 
Verse 31, he says, Therefore, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Do you hear all the identical language? But Paul goes to what we need to work hard to grow. He says, But instead, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God, holy, as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved you and gave himself up for you. You hear how relational these ideas are and how destructive they can be to the family of God. Tom Tom Schreiner says the sins listed here tear at the social fabric of the church, ripping away the threads of love that keep them together. So Peter signals no sin is to be tolerated in the community. No sin is to be tolerated in the people of God. And rightly so, right? I mean, malice. What's the definition of malice? Malice is the desire to inflict injury, harm, and suffering on a person, either because of a hostile impulse or a deep-seated hatred against them. You see how that would destroy unity and harmony in the community? How about the impact of deceit and hypocrisy, which are so closely related? But in both cases, there's lying, right? Deceit, that's lying. There's falsehood. There's a pretense that is disingenuous. That's hypocrisy. It's an outward facade of what's really going on in a person's heart. And yet, in so many ways, isn't that the world in which we live? I mean, just think a bit about the reality that we're a social media generation where we constantly, almost incessantly, it seems to me, post, send, or text all of these beautiful pictures, right, of of our vacations, of our gorgeous kids and our family fun times, right, where, where our homes are filled with smiles and laughter, happiness and perfect relationship. Yet is that reality? Is that really true? Is that the normal pattern of our lives? Is everybody's life perfect? According to Facebook, it is. Yeah, we know that's not true. Right, so that's a facade. So that we can have people think that way about us. Yet Christianity is supposed to be so radically different. Right, where there's humility, there's honesty, There's transparency. In fact, I want you to recognize that's why we have life groups. That's why we prioritize these small group gatherings. We want you to spend time with one another so that you can actually know what's going on in each other's lives. So you have the opportunity to be real with one another so that you can know the reality of each other's lives, not the facade of each other's lives. That way we can love one another. We can serve and sacrifice for one another. We can encourage one another. We can pray for one another. We can fight together against hypocrisy, against envy and slander and deceit. And we can work hard at having honest transparency, transparency, which is gloriously different. And I would suggest absolutely essential. I mean, do you recognize hypocrisy is a real threat to our faith? Don't you remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? I mean, when you think Pharisees, what do you think? Don't you think religious people who are hypocrites? What did he say to them? He said they preach, but they don't practice. So they say one thing, and they do another. Right, that's hypocrisy. What did Jesus say about hypocrisy? What did he say about the Pharisees? He said they're whitewashed tombs outwardly appear beautiful but inwardly are full of dead man's bones outwardly they appear righteous but inwardly they're full of hypocrisy and deceit and that destroys unity and harmony and I would suggest that destroys holiness in the church because we're supposed to be a people who are set apart Unique and distinct, first in our relationship with God, but then in our relationships with one another. 
But when there's envy, right, Christianity starts being a competition. It's like a religious version of one-upsmanship where we're trying to get you and your family to look better than them and their family, right? Only we don't do it in worldly things. Instead, we do it in churchy things, right? So, so now we try to make ourselves more righteous than them, more spiritual than them, more godly, more servant-hearted, more humble than them. When true godliness is marked by actually being others-focused, not competing, I mean, do you understand competition and relationships kills? It's the opposite of love. All right, we're called to rejoice in what God's doing in other people's lives, loving them and wanting them to grow in godliness, which means there's no place for envy in the church. Instead, we should be desiring what is best for our brothers and sisters in Christ rather than wanting them to, to struggle, decline and despair so that we can look better than them. That's not what we're called to do. And we're certainly called to not slander, but slander is not just limited to, to lying about people, but it involves disparaging other people. So, so well-timed, strategically placed, purposely worded comments that cause people to think badly about other people in the church. You know what I'm talking about. So how do we fight against these things? How do we cast out these evil attitudes and actions? Well, it's B, craving the pure milk of the word, which is exactly what Peter says in verse 2. And he gives us this awesome illustration, doesn't he, as he challenges us to be a holy people. Look at what he says, verse 2. He says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual Milk, literally long for the pure milk of the word. Why? So that you might grow up in salvation. So he gives us this picture, doesn't he, of a little baby craving their bottle. I can't help but think about my own experience with this with my family, right? We're in a different season right now. My kids are 18, 17, 15, and 13. They stopped drinking bottles. Now they just eat me out of house and home, right? <laughs> Eight pizzas to feed two kids or something like that, right? But there was a time when they were drinking bottles, right? right? I remember when Gabby was a little girl, right? She was the only one we had at the time. Right? She, she's crawling and she's walking and she's making her way. We lived in a small condo at the time, right? So we, so we had a kitchen, then we had a dining room, and we had a living room, and then we had a hallway, right? Can you picture that kind of condo? What does that mean for a little girl who's one and walking? Well, that's a racetrack. Right? That's what that was. And Gabby, when she first learned how to run, she would put one arm at her side and she would run like this. And she would, she would do lap after lap after lap. And I'd sit there at the dining room table, which was right like grandstands, right? As she just came back and she made her way through there and I would watch her run. And she would run and she would run, lap after lap after lap, until I would say this. Hey, Gabby, do you want your bottle? stops, spins on a dime, and comes running into the kitchen because she knew exactly where the microwave was and she knew exactly where the bottle was coming from. So, so picture this in her mind. She runs around, funny little girl, one-handed running, oblivious as if she doesn't understand anything that I'm saying to her, right? Doesn't know anything until I say those words. Do you want your bottle? And here she comes, running, busted. You know exactly what I'm saying, little girl. Right, but what does it highlight? Right, I could have said a lot of things and she didn't turn and run. But bottle, she comes running. Why? Because newborn infants, one-year-olds, love their milk. They love their bottle. They love it. They crave it. They long to have it. And Peter's saying that's how we should be with the pure milk of the word. We should love it. We should crave it. We should long to have it. Why? Well, that's C. Because it causes growth to eternal salvation. Look again in verse 2. Like newborn infants long for the pure milk of the word. So that by it you may grow up into salvation. And here's the warning. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. 
So again, the word of God, the living and abiding good news of the gospel is not only the power of God for salvation, but it's the power of God for sanctification so that we might be ready for eternal glory. Seeing our Savior face to face, that's what Peter's been talking about the entire book, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, chapter 1, verse 5. So what does that look like? Well, it's regularly putting sin to death and walking in righteousness with holy lives, both individually and corporately. So ongoing reconciled relationships in the family of God that prove, solidify that our faith is really in the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do we do that? How does that growth process happen? Well, he's telling us through the regular intake of the word of God. Because it transforms our lives, right? Paul tells us, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How do we transform our lives? By being renewed in the mind so that we might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, not by intellectual assent, but by lives that are transformed. We live good and acceptable and perfect lives. How do we do that? Only through the word of God because it brings clarity and understanding. It brings truth to our minds. If you've truly tasted that the Lord are good, meaning the good news of the gospel was preached, you heard it, you received it, you repented and believed in it, and you were born again. So what happens? You only want more of it, right? It, it, it saved you, so you want more of the word of God because it sanctifies you. Not that the word in and of itself, but it teaches you about God. It teaches you about man, right? Holiness, sinfulness, and that we have a Savior. It instructs us not only in salvation, but in sanctification. You want more and more and more of the Word of God. And it causes you to grow spiritually, which is evident and obvious to everyone who knows you. Real transformation, real change, real growth. How do I know that? because that's what happens to little babies that drink milk. First they crawl, then they walk, then they run. Isn't that evident and obvious? When a little baby grows, right? You, you see it, we have tons of babies in this church, right? And, and they're born and you look at them and they sit in a car seat, they can't do anything, right? Then all of a sudden they're crawling all over the place. Right, the next thing they do, what do they do then? Then they start furniture hopping. Right, they can't really walk, but they can hold here, and then they move to there. And then they fall down if they don't have furniture. And then all of a sudden, they're walking. Right? And then they're walking slow where you can still catch them. Next thing you know, a month later, boom, they're running. They're gone. Right? You see it. It's evident and obvious that they're growing. Well, the same should be true of every true believer. There should be real growth. There should be real transformation. There should be real change. There should be real holiness, individually and corporately. So here's the question, obvious question, question we seem to be asking a lot as a church. How are you doing in your time in the Word? Are you protecting it? Is it a priority to you? Are you getting good quantity time as well as good quality time? How do you know if you're really getting good quality time, good quantity time in the Word of God? Peter just told us there's growth, there's change, there's transformation in your life. It's not hocus pocus, like if I read it, suddenly I get transformed, right? It's not osmosis, you can't sleep with the Bible on your head. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about reading it, meditating on it, memorizing it, soaking in it, daydreaming about it. Because it teaches you about a holy God. You become holy. 
what you behold. Are you beholding God in the scriptures? Are you seeing the sinfulness of man? And are you being instructed on how you should put off sin and how you should put on righteousness? Is the word of God having its good effect on your life? You know, the Puritans used to ask the question, how are you getting along under the word? Is it having its good effect? Is your life being changed? Are you growing in godliness? Are you walking in holiness? See, when the word of God has its good effect, we not only, number one, love is the family of God, we, number two, long for the word of God, and we, number three, live as the people of God. If you would, allow me to read verses four to 10 again. Put these illustrations in your mind. Verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. First thing I want you to notice is that we're not given any commands here. Right, like we were in the previous sections, right? First section, Peter commanded us to love one another earnestly and from a pure heart. Second section, he commanded us to long for the pure milk of the word. He's not doing that here. There's no commands to follow. Why? Well, because Peter's not telling us how to be holy. He's not, he's not commanding holiness, but instead he's giving us illustrations, two illustrations, in fact, of what holiness looks like. The first is that we're called to be a holy temple of God. And the second is that we're called and commanded to be a holy priesthood of believers. Those are the two illustrations. But I want you to recognize, right, both are coming right out of the book of Exodus, starting with the holy temple of God, right? Remember, Exodus 30 to 40 is all about the tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? The tabernacle is the portable temple of God. It's the place where God meets with man. Also that we can be his people and he can be our God. In fact, do you know how the book ends, right? It's with the Shekinah glory, filling the tabernacle, filling the temple. So God dwelling in the midst of his people, which is only possible if they're a holy people. Well, Peter's picking up all of that language and he's applying it to the church. Notice the details, right? Verse 4 tells us that Jesus is the cornerstone who is rejected by men, no doubt talking about his crucifixion. But in the sight of God, verse 6, he's chosen and precious. And notice is described as a living stone. Why? Because he's a living Savior. So Peter's highlighting not only his death, but his burial and his resurrection and the reality that Christ rose from the grave. But the picture, the illustration, is that every one of us who come to him, who confess that Jesus is the Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we're not only saved, but we're living stones in this glorious edifice, this spiritual house, this holy temple of God. Why? Because God dwells in the midst of his people. Now through the power of the Holy Spirit, but one day we will be his people and he will be our God for all eternity. And it'll be just like the Garden of Eden. 
That's a glorious picture of what it's going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. Right? We will see him face to face. We will walk with him in the cool of the day. He will be our God and we will be his people. All things will be glorious, wonderful. Second Peter says it's a place in which righteousness dwells. That's the second coming of Christ. But for those who reject him, be clear, it's shame. Do you know what shame is? It's the painful feeling of humiliation and distress caused by the conscious awareness of wrong behavior. What exactly would that be here? Well, look, it's in verse 8. Jesus Christ is the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. They've rejected him and they stumble. Why? Verse 8, because they disobeyed his word. Now remember what we were told, Exodus 19, 5. Therefore, if you will obey my voice, if you will keep my commandment, if you will be obedient to my word, then you will be my treasured possession. You will be a kingdom of priests. You will be a holy nation. I want to appeal to you this morning to not be foolish by being disobedient to the word, disobedient to the good news of the gospel, the glorious offer of salvation that only comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me put it this way. Do you really want to experience torment and shame for all eternity? Can you imagine kicking yourself for all eternity for not responding to the glorious offer of the gospel that was proclaimed to you? That you could be, not in this situation, but you could be a treasured possession for all eternity. That you could be in his, ple- in his presence where there's fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore rather than shame and torment. I appeal to you. Put your faith in Christ not only for the salvation of your soul, but the fact that he promises to change you, to transform you by the power of the Spirit, the Word of God taking effect in your life, real change, real growth, real holiness. Right, and we need to be clear this morning, right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So we need to repent, believe, be saved, and be transformed by the ongoing work of the Word of God in our lives, the gospel, so that we are transformed, so that we are holy, so that we can see the Lord and be with Him for all eternity. Which brings us to picture number two, that believers are not only the holy temple of God, but we're also the holy priesthood of believers. And how does that happen? Well, again, it's by being responsive to the word of God, the good news of the gospel, and believing in Jesus, right? It's the result of faith that we become a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. But again, it's purposeful, right? Look at what he says. He says, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness, out of judgment, and into his marvelous light. That's salvation. And what's the grounding for this work? Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Oh, how glorious those words are. Are. It's not on the basis of us figuring it out. It's not because we finally got it and started fixing ourselves up. That's not what he's saying. He's saying it's on the basis of his finished work. It's on the basis of his mercy and his grace not only sending us the one true Passover lamb who died so that we can be forgiven of our sin, but the ongoing mercy of trusting in Christ that it transforms us. That's the good work that he does in our lives, that we would be a chosen race, a holy nation. We would tra- he saved us for the purpose of holiness. Holiness. 
then he calls us to work it out, right? He says, right, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. May we be a holy people that love as the family of God, long for the word of God, and live as the people of God. But what does it look like for us to live as the people of God? It means that we proclaim the excellencies of him who has done that good work in our lives so that they too might be part of the family of God. Love as the family of God, long for the word of God, and live as the people of God. You see how that works itself out? God has saved us so that we might be holy, grounded on his work in our lives. May God give us the grace to love as the family of God, long for the word of God, and live as the people of God. Allow me to pray to that end. Father, we're grateful. We're grateful for the continuity of your word. Father, we're grateful to know that the things that are declared in Exodus are also declared in 1 Peter. Father, that you're the one who has saved us, that you have given us the one true Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, that those who believe in him are delivered from judgment and death and are delivered from our enslavement to sin so that we might live holy lives. Father, I pray that you would be doing a good work in our minds, that you would be doing a good work in our hearts, that we would delight all the more in the Lord Jesus Christ, that it would motivate us, remembering where it is that we've come from, that our lives would be transformed. There would be real change, real transformation, real godliness, real holiness. Father, we pray that 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 would not be just the case individually, but it would be corporately in our love for one another. Father, do that good work for our good and for your eternal glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.